So it is the last Sunday of 2018. Um, you may have seen the email that I sent out that has uh, a prayer guide for the first 40 days of prayer in the new year, also a, a reading guide. Um, I also have copies back there on the table if you'd like a paper copy this morning. Uh, that reading guide is just the one that I'm going to do this year. I did a different one last year. I did a different one than that the year before. Some of you may prefer to do electronic kind of stuff, you know, do it on your phone or your computer where it actually, you know, reminds you to do it and tells you what to do. But I would encourage all of us to be in prayer in the Word every day of the new year. So the story's told of two men who were fishing one Sunday morning, and when the fish weren't biting, they began to feel a little guilty, thinking... Maybe we should have gone to church, right? So one of them said to the other, I should have gone to church this morning rather than go fishing. And the other one said to him, well, I couldn't have gone to church anyway. My wife is homesick in bed. <laughs> go fishing without your wife? And, and Anyhow, we might laugh at the inconsistency in that man's thinking, and yet it's not that unusual. Sometimes we go through many rationalizations, rationalizations about why I don't, don't need to do the thing I need to do or why I, I'm not going to do the thing I should do and all kinds of rationalizations we go through. And sometimes those rationalizations lead us to put other things ahead of our need to worship, to fellowship with God's people on the Lord's day. So as we begin a new year in just a few days, I want to challenge us. To have a renewed commitment to the priority of the Lord's day. A new commitment to the priority of the Lord's day. But as we proceed with this emphasis, I want to be sure that no one misunderstands me. Um, as important as the Lord's day is, I know that we are to serve the Lord every day of the week, right? God wants us to be... Christians every day, 24-7 servants of the Lord. He doesn't just want Sunday Christians. He wants everyday Christians. And so if we're going to be walking with God every day, then certainly we must also give Sunday, the Lord's Day, a special place in our weekly calendar. So as you likely know, there are some sad and harmful trends taking place in our worlds today. Uh, the, the Lord's Day is certainly under attack from our, soul, our secular culture, but that shouldn't come as a surprise to us as we are less and less uh, a Christian-oriented nation. What's really shocking, though, is that the attacks are working. There is a growing indifference among Christians about the priority of the Lord's Day. Fewer Christians are being consistent in their worship practices. Fewer Christians are committed to participating in Sunday school. And then even those who might actually consistently worship on Sunday or may even go to Bible class, fewer are willing to do anything other than that. So if there are other activities of the church on the Lord's Day, then they aren't involved in those things. For many people, once the worship service has ended, so has their participation in and their motivation for other spiritual things. And that's not a good thing. So let's spend a few minutes this morning considering the priority of the Lord's day and how we might be more faithful in serving our Lord in the year 2019. So let's start with the priority of of the Lord's day. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, the Apostle John says, On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. And you know he was on the island of Patmos at that time. But the identification of the Lord's day should not be confused with another scriptural phrase called the day of the Lord. Those are not talking about the same day, right? The day of the Lord is a technical expression about the day when the Lord will return in judgment. That's the day of the Lord. The Lord's day is the scriptural name for the day on which God's people should come together and worship. Uh, it's known as Sunday or the first day of the week. 
The respected church historian named Philip Schaff, in volume one of his eight-volume set on the history of the Christian church, affirmed that the Lord's Day is connected to the facts which lie at the foundation of the church. This is what he writes. It was on that day that Christ rose from the dead, that he appeared to Mary, the disciples of Emmaus, the assembled apostles, that he poured out his spirit and founded the church, that he revealed to, those, to his beloved disciples the mystery of the future. And he further declared the universal and uncontradicted Sunday observance in the second century can only be explained by the fact that it had its roots in apostolic practice. The priority of the Lord's Day. The Bible tells us there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, Sunday, we came together to break bread. Paul preached to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking till midnight. I'm not leaving tomorrow, so I don't have to keep talking till midnight today, right? We also know the Lord's people were told to give on the first day of every week. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. The writings of the early church fathers attest to the priority of the Lord's day. The didache also known as the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, is a brief, anonymous, early Christian treatise dated by most scholars in the first century. And it says, But every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread, and give thanksgiving after having confessed your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. In A.D. 110, Ignatius of Antioch wrote these words, If therefore those who lived according to the old practices, the Jews, have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in observance of the Lord's day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death, let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the Resurrection Day, the Queen and Chief of all days of the week. I like that. Justin Martyr wrote in his first apology in A.D. 140, And on the day called Sunday, there is a gathering together in the same place of all who live in a city or a rural district, but Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. So turning our attention back to that article by the church historian Philip Schaff, he explained that a a proper observance of the Lord's Day is a wholesome school of discipline, a means of grace for the people, a safeguard of public morality and religion, a bulwark against infidelity, a source of immeasurable blessing to the church, the state, and the family. Next to the church and the Bible, the Lord's Day is the chief pillar of a Christian society. So in other words, the Lord's Day has many benefits for the individual, for the church as a whole, for communities, and for the world. So let's move from the priority of the Lord's Day to what we might call the assault on the Lord's Day. Now, I'm not old enough, but maybe a few of you are, to remember a time when the Lord's Day was honored as a whole, amongst most people in our country and around the world, is a day of worship and a day of rest. In that day, businesses were closed on Sundays, and farmers didn't go out into the fields and work on those days. Obviously, things are very different in regards to the Lord's Day today. Sunday, for most people, has become fun day, not Sunday. And unfortunately for many people, their plans for Sunday leave no room for God. 
So an assault on the Lord's Day is coming at us from at least three different sources. Uh, let's talk about them briefly. The first source, the Lord's Day, is uh, for many it's just a time for shopping. In other way, it's just business as usual. Sunday shopping appeals to that materialism that is very much a part of the culture in which we live. But it's ironic to me that with so many businesses open so many days of the week, some of them 24-7, why is there still a need for shopping on Sundays when you can do it around the clock any other day? I came across an interesting article by Richard Morin from the Pew Research Center titled, The Devil's New Playground. The Shopping Mall. It's an interesting title, right? He writes, who knew that Satan worked at the local mall? While bars and cheap hotels and similar places of low repute may remain America's favorite spots to sin, two economists say that giving people an extra day to shop at the mall also contributes significantly to wicked behavior, especially among people who are the most religious. Jonathan Gruber of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and David Hungerman states that counties, that states and counties that repeal so-called blue laws, oh, I got him out of myself, I'm sorry. So it was, it was uh, John Gruber of Massachusetts Institute and David Hungerman of Notre Dame discovered the malevolent mall effect by studying what happened when states and counties repeal so-called blue laws. Those statutes prohibited the sale on Sunday of certain non-essential items, such as clothing, appliances, furniture, and jewelry, typically sold in shopping malls, as well as liquor and cigarettes. Gruber and Hungerman found that when states eliminated blue laws, church attendance declined while drinking and drug use increased significantly among young adults. Even more striking, the biggest change in the bad behaviors was concentrated among those who frequently attended religious services. They report in a working paper called The Church Versus the Mall, What Happens When Religion Faces Increased Secular Competition. They found that church attendance declined after blue laws were repealed, with the biggest drop occurring among those who went to church at least once a week. Instead of going to church, many of the faithful were apparently going astray. Marijuana use increased. Cocaine use increased by nearly 4 percentage points. Heavy drinking rose by 5.5 percentage points among churchgoers. Hmm, they write. That's interesting. But why would the elimination of blue laws suddenly provoke such an outburst of sin sinning among the religious? After all, six other days of the week were already available to shop or to drink till you drop. And buying cocaine or marijuana is illegal any day of the week. That's the million-dollar question, Hungerman said. He suspects that keeping businesses open on Sunday means that some religious young people have to work or choose to go shopping, which apparently increases their exposure to sinners or otherwise weakens their resistance to the dark side. Isn't all that very interesting? The power of materialism can weaken us in many different ways. So the first attack on the Lord's Day is what we might call shopping. The second attack, the Lord's Day is under assault from sports. Mm. Now I'm really meddling, right? Sports. For many years, professional sports have been played on Sundays, right? Football, baseball have long time been played on Sundays, but usually they were played in ways that wouldn't necessarily affect people going to church. But drastic changes have occurred in the past decades. Now children are being drawn into playing sports on Sundays, and not just after church services, which certainly could be done, but during church services. Precious young people who should be in Sunday school and worship are out on ball fields. Now, a letter to the editor of the Tennessean, June 17th of 2006, addressed arguments made to justify Sunday sports for children. And the, art, and the article of the letter said this, 
The children get to meet new people and see new towns and experience few things children ever get to experience. But at what cost? The financial expense can range anywhere from a few hundred dollars to nearly $5,000. Some of those expensive travel teams, right? The spiritual costs cannot be calculated. The spiritual costs cannot be calculated. And I'm sure there are parents who, by their actions, place more emphasis on sports than worshiping God and whose children, now grown, show no interest or involvement with the Lord and His church. And that's something they certainly regret. And that's sad. I'm sure you'd agree. So sports is attacking the primacy of the Lord's day. And a third thing is just what we might call selfishness. The selfish attitude says, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. So what would we want to do on Sunday rather than worship the Lord? Well, some might say, I want to sleep in. It's the only day I get to sleep in. Some might want to say, well, I want to watch TV, or I want to go fishing, or I want to go golfing, or I want to go shopping, as we've already talked about. Some say, more nobly, I want to spend time with my family. But the emphasis is on self and what it wants rather than on the Lord and what he commands. Just how effective are these attacks on the Lord's Day? One might observe how effective the attacks are by noticing how the denominational world is reacting to the problem of the lack of interest in Sunday as a day of worship. Uh, John MacArthur Jr., who you may be familiar with, he's a writer, he's a radio preacher and teacher from Grace Community Church in California. He wrote this, Judging from attendance figures, lots of church members feel spending the Lord's Day in church is tantamount to blowing the whole day. Some churches now offer their largest services on Friday and Saturday night instead of Sunday morning, and those services are usually heavy on music and entertainment, unquote. I'm told the research says that for Americans, the least committed hour of the week for Americans is Saturday at 5 p.m. And that's why many churches have begun to hold services on Saturday afternoon or evening. You can get in there and get it out of the way and still have all the night and the whole next day to do whatever you want to do with your day. You think that's a good idea? I don't think so. Let's end with our commitment to the Lord's Day. For faithful Christians and churches, the attack on the Lord's Day is a time for conviction, it's a time for commitment, it's not a time for compromise. The key to honoring God on the Lord's Day is not by so-called blue laws. Uh, Keeping people in church on Sundays isn't the government's responsibility, right? The key is not outlawing shopping or outlawing sports on Sunday morning or or even outlawing uh, selfishness if you could somehow do that but standing firm and faithful in the midst of this post-Christian world in which we live. Respect for the Lord's Day comes from a respect for the Son of God and a spirit of obedience to Him. It's my personal responsibility to keep Sunday, Sun Day, S-O-N Day, right? God's Son's Day. May people today say and believe what the psalmist of old said there in Psalm 122 and verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Don't you love that passage? Isn't that the attitude you want to have when you wake up on Sunday morning and you know, I get to go and to worship God today. I get to go and to be with my church family today. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, I hope you won't misunderstand me today. I'm not saying that Sunday is to be observed just like the Jewish Sabbath. Under that old covenant, the Jewish people, God gave very detailed instructions about what they should and should not do on the Sabbath. And of course, as you know, the Pharisees took those rules and expanded upon them greatly, and the Sabbath became a burden. 
rather than the blessing that God intended it to be. In that Isaiah 58 passage that I chose for the scripture reading, let's notice that God's people of old were not keeping the Sabbath as God commanded. They were doing as they pleased on the holy day. Look again at these words. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What I find encouraging in that passage is God's promise. If they would simply honor God and honor the day the Lord had made there on the Sabbath, they would find delight in the Lord. They would receive God's blessing. We're not under that covenant, but under the new covenant that we're under, I think the same is true. If we'll honor the day of the Lord, right? The, or, or the Lord's day, rather, not the day. If we'll honor the Lord's day, Sunday, the first day of the week, surely we will find delight in the Lord and receive God's blessings. Therefore, I want to suggest a commitment to the Lord's day should include the following. First, a participation in Sunday school and Sunday, uh, Sunday worship. Now, the point isn't just being present for attendance purposes, not, not just checking that box and, and that kind of a thing, but to give ourselves fully in participation. We should come reverently, meaning humbly and with a seriousness. We should come enthusiastically, meaning joyfully and excitedly. We should come expectantly, expecting to meet God, to, to commune with God, to be changed. And the result of the participation in worship and study and fellowship should be the lifting of our spirits, the encouraging of our hearts, the challenging of our minds, and ultimately the transforming and strengthening of our lives. But we can't have that without a participation in worship and Bible study. The second commitment that I would suggest to the Lord's Day should include a dedication to the Lord in fellowship with His body, the church. Now again, I'm not trying to lay down laws which God hasn't given us to lay down, right? But we are commanded to meet together and to not give up meeting together. Like Hebrews 11 and 24 and 25 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. For most of us, Sunday's a day when we aren't required to go to work. Or we don't have to go to school. And we're all glad about that. Why not devote as much of that time as possible to spiritual things? Why not use that time to visit with and minister to each other? Why not use that time for devotional study and family activity? And if there is some gathering or activity of the church, then by all means, let's try to be involved in it. Surely that's a part of what it means to honor the Lord's day. Let me leave you with an illustration told by a Chinese preacher. Came to pass that a man went to the market with a string of seven coins. And seeing a beggar who asked for alms, he gave the man six of the coins and kept one for himself. The beggar, instead of being thankful, followed the good man and stole the seventh coin also. And we might conclude, what a selfish evil man, and not be satisfied with six, but want the seventh. Yes, and you are not, and are you not likewise to whom God has given six days, and yet steals the seventh also? Well, the new year's before us, and as I always like to say, it's, it's another opportunity to get it right, to get it right, a start over, a do over. And aren't you thankful that God gives us so many chances? So why not begin the new year with a renewed commitment to honor 
the Lord's day. And surely God will bless us as we love Him and seek Him and obey Him every day in the new year.